How high will Keon Coleman and Jared Verse go in the 2024 NFL Draft? You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back into Locked On Seminoles. I am your host, Brian Smith. Thank you for everyone that comes and checks out this show as often as they can. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts for free and on YouTube. Part of the awesome Locked On Network, your team every single day. Today's show is going to be a dual opportunity as we have Brandon Olson, who does NFL 33. He's also everybody's favorite Locked On Gators host. I know Seminole fans just love that, but it is what it is. Let's talk some NFL draft and Florida State. I believe it's 12 guys, if I remember correctly, went to the combine. Just kind of projecting like which players go where in the draft. Do you think they're first round picks, pros and cons? This this kind of fun, really, because that's a lot of guys, man. 12 is a high number. I believe it's third. Michigan 18, Washington 13. They were both really experienced teams. We'll talk about that polar opposite for your Gators in, in here in just a little bit. But Starting off top of the board, I'm fascinated because the story is cool. Jared Verse comes from freaking Albany, wasn't offered a D1 scholarship out of high school. It's just a great story. It really is. Projected top 20 by some people, but there's still a lot of varying r- reports. And, and just to clarify here, just because you see some draft site project a player at spot, whatever, it's relevant because if one team likes you in the first round, that's all that matters. And that's why the draft is a crapshoot. There are teams that you and I both hear stories. Somebody took a guy off the board because they didn't like his interview, and another team had him number 15 overall. Like, that stuff happens. So what do you think about Jared Verse, and why would you or would you not take him in the first round? No, I'd take him in the top 15. Uh, I, I love Jared Verse's film. I think that he's just – you get an explosive edge rusher like that that just runs with power. I mean – Everyone watching this probably watched uh, Florida versus Florida State <laughs> and saw Jared verse literally throw an off <laughs> into Max Brown. Like that kind of power is just insane. And, and all it takes is one guy like Daniel Jones. A few years ago, one team asked him to work out at tight end and the Giants took him number six overall to be their franchise quarterback. Like all it takes is That's one it. team to make a really <laughs> bad decision with some guys but for jared verse like you, you mentioned his story is insane he's from like, dayton ohio went to albany uh covid hit he gained 40 pounds during covid and really just changed his body and became just an insane pass rusher um i remember when he hit the portal i was begging him to come to florida uh, <laughs> i was a big fan of his you know and uh so jared verse is a hell of a rusher and the versatility that he has with finesse and power makes him enticing, makes him scheme versatile. And I think that every NFL team is looking for that from an edge guy where it's like, well, you might go against a giant offensive tackle. Like you might go up against Dewan Jones with the Cleveland Browns who, who set the NFL combine record for wingspan for an offensive tackle. And so you're going to have to get around a guy like that or through him. And then you might also go against someone the, on the Miami Dolphins, who typically has smaller offensive linemen because they go the the full wide zone. And Jared Verse can beat them both. And I think that gives him a massive advantage when we talk about his NFL prospects. That's kind of where I'm at. I think it's legitimate that he could be a top 10 pick. Again, your point, Daniel Jones is an extreme and you're a Giants guy, and that's that's your own fault. I can't help you there. But at the same time, Sixth overall for a guy a lot of people didn't really like going into that draft. People like, eh, I don't know. He went six. Everybody's like, I have a third round pick. Sixth overall. That's why the New York Giants are the New York Giants. That's just, <laughs> it's just yeah. that's where they are. So they don't have a top 20 quarterback, and that's why they're they suck. But there you go. Verse, I think, is unique for me and why I think he's a possible top 10 pick. He could play either end spot, and he could like you brought up a really good point. Power. The hardest thing to do is be a pass rusher who could also two gap or at least kind of quote unquote hold his water against a three hundred twenty pound man versus two fifty five ish 
something in that range. He goes up and down, I'm sure. But even if he got up to 265, something like that, he reminds me of a former giant, Justin Tuck, who played end at Notre Dame strictly, but he moved around when he played for the Giants, gained weight. I think Verse could gain a little weight, play some inside on third and six. How many offensive guards are going to want to see Jared Verse in front of them on third and six? Zero. Not many. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Maybe Quentin Nelson, and he might be the only one that's like, ah, I don't care who's there. I got it. Quentin Nelson is not part of planet Earth. He's just here. But that's different. The point is still the same. There are very few guys that can handle that. I'd imagine that it's going to make it hard for any team looking for D-line help, and half the NFL is always looking for D-line help, not to take him at least top 12 to kind of split the middle between 10 and 15. I would be surprised. And it seems like he's the kind of guy that interviews well, et cetera, too. So I think we're both on par here. There will be multiple teams that have him as a top 15 pick that are actually selecting in the top. That's the other part. You don't have a pick that you're up that high. doesn't make any difference. Transitioning, the other guy that is consistently talked about is Keon Coleman, and there's also Braden Fisk I want to get into. With Coleman, we both agreed before the show, the one clear concern is just sheer speed, and I brought up something to you as well. He was hurt so much last year. I don't know how fast he really is in football season. What I mean by that is can you take – getting banged up in the NFL, you're sure going to get hit a lot and then come back each week. Durability is your number one trait or not. That's the concern. And that's why I don't think he'll go the first round and he could even go late second or early third. I have a really hard time picking where he's going. What are your thoughts on Keon Cole? I think he winds up going somewhere in the middle of day two, that late second, early third. Um, you can mention, yeah, like the best ability is availability and, and he's been banged up and you're going to play more games in the NFL. That's a, and it's a pretty like significant jump now, especially now it's 17 games. It's not just oh, a few more. It, it's the, now you're playing five more games or if you play in a bowl game or whatnot, then it changes there, but you're playing considerably more games. Um, and, and if you can't stay healthy during a college football season, especially where you, you got kind of banged up in, in week, week two, week three, something like that, then really hard to sell that you can stay healthy. And even if, if your film is worse because you were banged up, then you're, the NFL team is not going to care because one, you either can't stay healthy or two, they don't know what you look like healthy. So how can they value you there? Um, I, I think he's someone that I, I really do like his film. Um, but I just think that when we talk about cons like consistently separating against quality defensive backs, he struggled there a little bit and, and he makes all the contested catches and that's cool. And he's totally a guy where you could just go, Hey, yeah, he, he can make contested catches. It doesn't matter if he separates the NFL doesn't think like that anymore. They've been burned by Nikhil Harry with the Patriots and Drake London with the Falcons hasn't worked out that much. So they've been burned by that and they go, all right, we don't care if you can make the contested catches. We want to know why you were making so many contested catches. <laughs> and it's because you can't separate and, and Teams will judge that and teams will hurt you for that because you're playing in a modern NFL where they want to be small. They want to be fast. They want to separate consistently. And if you can't do that, then, then you just don't fit in. Yeah. I think the speed thing, and it's really cool. Like what the dolphins are doing. They hurt guys just from an osmosis. Cause everybody's seen the dolphins. It's fun. It, it's fun. But that doesn't mean there are a lot of guys like that. You know what I mean? The guys that are four, three and stuff like Brian Thomas, though, similar size that didn't help him either. This is a good year for the draft and receiver. Thomas ran four, three, three. Good Lord. He's like the third or fourth guy I ever. See. I mean, depending on who you talk to, that's hard. So it, it's interesting. I don't see him going in the first round. That's about as far as I'll go. But again, it only takes one team in the second round to really like him because he is a good player. He seems like a good guy. So, I think he'll end up going in the second round late if I had to be pushed, but if he went to the third, it wouldn't shock me either. Here in just a moment, we're going to talk a little bit more about the opportunity for some more roles to go in the draft. Talk about Renardo Green, Braden Fisk, and several other people. Have you got Fire TV? If you haven't yet, you should. I've had it since 2016. It's an easy app. You can adapt it on the back of your TV, or you can actually buy a Fire TV. It's your destination for sports, live game highlights, or in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences, and you can get it 
very easily. Also, it's a lot cheaper than cable. My dad is still the guy paying 150 plus dollars a month for the same stuff I am when I pay 80 bucks a month and I'm using YouTube TV on a fire stick. Don't make the same mistake. Additionally, Fire TV also has their own Fire TV channels. Just say, Alexa, play Fire TV channels, and they will have a lot of short clips, movies, different sports, all kinds of stations, and even sections that are like YouTube with little short clips that you can watch on anything that you want from news blurbs to sports and more. Fire TV is a great way to do it. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com forward slash locked on Fire TV. V. All right, let's get Brandon back on here. Braden Fisk, another guy that's a great story. Uh, was it Western Michigan or Central? It was one of the two Western. Okay. Transfers to Florida State. Early on, I wasn't sure if he was a guy, but he got better and better. Like he was a guy, even though D tackle was a grind. He had six, I believe, six sacks or something like that. He's a guy that can rush the passer from the interior, plays hard, has the natural size. He's 290-ish. What do you think? Is he a guy that could play some nose guard, or is he just a three-tech? And where do you project him at the National Football League level? I think at the NFL level, he's, he's kind of purely a three-tech right now. Uh, he's someone who his film is fun to watch because he just wrecks dudes at the college level. But when he plays against those bigger guards, if they get hands on him, he kind of struggles a little bit. And when you're playing the NFL, these guys are so much more skilled than college guards there. But I think that a big thing that's going to hurt Braden Fisk is his size. He's 61st percentile height, 17th percentile weight, 5th percentile wingspan, 3rd percentile arm length. Like It's going to be really tough when you go against these guys that are skilled at the NFL level and you have to go against them consistently and win those battles. I think that if you get them in a scheme where they go, hey, you're just going to be a, a gap shooting kind of guy, which happens very frequently now. It's a common thing here. You can have that role. Uh, but I think that him being limited to that role is what's going to kind of hurt his stock a, a little bit. But he had arguably as good a pre-draft process as anybody in the entire draft class. I mean, he showed up to the senior bowl, dominated them in every sense of the word, dominated he interviewed very well i was down there for that week he interviewed well he dominated he played well then he had the combine and he yeah his size not great but his athletic testing was awesome it was for especially his size it was great testing so i think that he's done about as well as you can in the pre-draft process and wherever we see him getting drafted is about as high as an nfl team will possibly take him as far as where do we value him? I think he's he's gotten his value as high as he possibly can. Uh, and I think that a three-tech team, like like the Chiefs, where they just have Chris Jones wreck stuff, and then you can take him off the field and put Braden Fisk on or put them both there at the same time, the Eagles, a team like that where they're like, we just need one D-tackle that can just shoot gaps and cause havoc, I think that they'll value Braden Fisk maybe in the second round. I think that's a possibility. It just depends on what you're looking for because he's a niche player in that sense because he's not going to be a two-gap guy. Has to play in a 4-3 or be a specialist on third downs if you're a 3-4 team. And I, I still don't know why a 3-4 team would take him. Unless they wanted to make him a big end, and I, I'm not sure about that. So only about half the teams would really look at because about half the league plays 3-4, about half the team plays 4-3 as a base. But that being stated, his productivity in the All-Star game – and just back half of last season, he's a football player. So I'm curious about that. But uh, I'm guessing he's going to go third round, give or take. That's a guess. But some of the arm length and that stuff could, could hinder him a bit. A guy that I'm intrigued by because I thought he was underrated going into last year, and he, he proved me right to a certain degree, was Trey Benson. Uh, he's the guy that, if you remember correctly, scored three touchdowns against a team from Gainesville. Um, he's also – for NFL, because it's a different game for running backs. I pulled up his stats a second ago. He's unique because most bigger backs are like strong body kids like him. They're, they're not always great in the, in the pass game, but Florida State rotated running backs a lot, but he still had 20 catches, 227 yards, 11.3, and a score. That's pretty decent. And if you're going to play in the NFL, they throw a lot of checkdowns. 
not turning the ball over is like 70% of the game because everybody's so equal talent wise. He could pass protect. What do you think about Trey Benson? And it's not necessarily the round picking running backs and where they're going to the draft is really hard. But what do you think he can bring to an NFL team? And if you want to guess round, feel free. I'm, I struggle with it. I, I think we can genuinely right now be talking about the highest drafted running back in the class. Uh, I, I think he's very good. I think his film's great. Um, yeah, I, I think that he's one of the better backs, if not the best back. And I think his versatility is a big selling point, like you mentioned, with being able to contribute in the passing game. Uh, I do think that he's got to cut down on – he tries to be cute sometimes. Like, he tries to, to be dancy when he shouldn't be dancy. Like, you're as big as he is – run through it dude just, guy. Some, sometimes he tries to dance and you just don't have to do that uh, i think any gap scheme and any gap heavy offense will be best for him because i do think he's a bit indecisive in the backfield when it comes to actually finding a lane and hitting it which is a little confusing just considering he played for mike norvell <laughs> and so you would think that he'd be able to figure out the lane and get there but i do think that he he gets a bit indecisive there but if you get a gap team like the ravens the Rams, the, a team that's already a playoff team that you wants to run over the, the top. Yeah, yeah. And, and wants to just bring that gap scheme there, you can do it. And he can go kind of high, but I also think that him being more gap-oriented could hurt him a little bit. Like, the Dolphins aren't going to touch him. There's, there's no need for them to take him. And so I think that maybe that limits him a little bit, but also we're kind of seeing the, the renaissance of gap scheme. Like, we see it every – so often we see kind of kind of cycle and it's like all right well we're gonna go more more we're going more for speed or we're going more for gap steam here more zone whatever it may be i think we're kind of seeing teams shift back towards that gap. i mean sean McVay is is known as as a wide zone guy and in 2023 the rams the rams ran more gap scheme than any other team in the nfl uh they completely changed things around and so i think that we're gonna see teams go more gap scheme here Kyron Williams ran some of that at Notre Dame, and I think that's part of it. He's a very versatile back, so this just didn't make bacon coach. Um, I also am curious about Bernardo Green. Interesting player to me because Florida State had a lot of DBs, and they still do. But is he humongous? No, he's he's around six foot, 180-some pounds. He could run. But, I mean, he had 43 tackles last year, only one pick. But, like – Ramsey, if I remember right, coming out, never even had an interception in college. Like it, that's that's kind of hard to project. Where do you think he's a better at? Is it nickel? Is it is it corner? Is it is it you know, is he a special teams guy? What do you think he can do? And why would you, if you were selling him as his agent, why should he go in the draft top five rounds? Something like that. I mean, somebody might even look at him second or third, but I think it's harder because there's so many guys similar to size. Yeah, I think we see him go in the third or fourth round here. I, I am a fan of his tape. I think he's great in press, man. His size is going to be something that teams will be concerned about. And some teams right away are going to see his, I think he was like 5'11 and 5'8 or something like that at the combine. Some teams are going to say that and go, okay, he's either in the slot or we're not touching him. And just, again, whether or not you think that's a smart approach or a dumb approach, it's what NFL teams do. They go, like, Keon Coleman, it's we know true. he's faster than 461, but he ran a 461. And teams That's are true. going to say he ran a 461. I'm out. I don't care about the the GPS time that he's clocked in games that don't indicate 461. But Renardo Green, 5'11 and 5'8 or 7 uh, he he's going to be bumped down to either nickel or completely off a board if teams don't view him as someone that can play in the nickel. I think that one area that he's great in is is that press man, but he does – I feel like his eyes are really inconsistent in zone coverage, and that's what doesn't bode well for him. I think more than the size because you're looking at an NFL defensive scheme right now or defensive era where they play a ton of cover three, they play a ton of quarters, they play a ton of cover six, and they want to play those versatile coverages that you can make look the same pre-snap and then change it post-snap. And so a guy that's great in press man, there's a limited – demand for someone like that so you can draft him and say hey we can teach him how to do what we need him to do and he can already play press man or you can just draft a guy 
that can already play like like TJ Tampa is probably going to be in the same area as Renardo Green. TJ Tampa not good in man coverage, great in zone coverage. A team and it has significantly better size. A team is going to value TJ Tampa over Renardo Green. But if you have a team that wants to play press man, like if Wink Martindale was still with the New York Giants, he'd be going as early as they possibly can take him because they just want to play press man. And so if you have a team that wants that, Renardo Green's your guy. Like I think if you're looking scheme specific, he's incredibly valuable because you'll be able to get him late on day two or early on day three. But there's just not a lot of demand for that right now. All right. Thank you. Um, next up, we're going to talk a little bit about how the draft impacts Florida State, Florida. And it's an opportunity to even pick on the Gators a little bit, which I I know Brandon is excited about. We're going to do that next here at Locked On Seminoles. And we're also going to talk a little bit of projection for 2024. FanDuel. If you have not checked out FanDuel, you should do so now. The sports calendar is loaded and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 when you bet on the tournament, MLB, NBA, NHL, whatever it might be. You have so many different options. Visit FanDuel slash locked on and make your first bet a big win. FanDuel. America's number one sports book. All right, let's talk with Brandon about his favorite subject, Florida struggling. And uh, they did have, we were talking earlier, I was like, how many guys did the Gators send to the draft to? It's, it's just a young team, and this goes in cycles. Florida wasn't a great team last year, but they're also really young. It's, it's legit. When you look at it, in Florida historically since 90, since Spurrier got there, and they've sent, I don't know what it is, but they're top eight, I'm sure, in NFL draft picks conservatively. The three Florida schools, Miami's number one. Florida State would be pretty high up there, Bama, Georgia. Do you think that a lot of kids, and I have my own take on this and some insights being in the recruiting world, do you think a lot of kids really watch the draft that are recruits? And do you think a lot of kids that are even out of school like UF or Florida State now at the portal, everybody's a recruit at all times, whether you want to hear it or not. How much does that impact things in your eyes? I think it definitely plays a, a little bit of a role in a way. Like I don't think that there are necessarily kids watching NFL drafting going on. I didn't, I didn't hear this school called, but I do think that it can help you to identify which schools do get their names called a lot. Like if you're not someone who follows college football much and you're like, oh, there's, there's about eight Georgia guys being, being called right now, then that's going to, pop out to you. Uh, I think that when you look at maybe not the NFL draft directly, but which guys get you to the NFL, you're going to see like every receiver is going to look at Ohio state and go, Oh, Brian Hartline gets every, everything he touches becomes a first round pick in the NFL draft. Uh, and, and so things like that, but I, I do think that it plays a part and we've had multiple guys where they just go, I want to play for this guy. Cause he gets guys to the NFL, like got quarterbacks. They want to go play for Lincoln Riley. Receivers, they want to go play for Brian Hartline. DBs wanted to go play for Nick Saban, for Corey Raymond, before he completely tanked his value. <laughs> Guys do that. Like, like they want to go to the NFL because I, I think there are very few players who are sought after high school recruits that don't have the vision of wanting to go play in the NFL. Whether or not they can actually realistically make it there, they still want to go to the spot that gives them the best chance to get there. I think that's pretty fair, and I I brought this up on yesterday's show. I found this out just through osmosis. With all the combines, practices, games I go to, you're standing on the sideline and there's a rec recruit sitting there. Even if I'm not talking to them, you can still hear what they're saying. They'll be talking about, yeah, I got this O, that O, that O. O means offer. That's just recruit lingo. And the two or three most coveted O's are Ohio State, Georgia, those are probably the two most right now because Bama's now in kind of limbo. It's still Bama, but it's a little different. And then Clemson was until recently, but it's they just don't offer a lot of guys. But it's tiers. And one of the reasons there's tiers is because those teams can be picky because they're getting elite recruits year after year. Look, my grandmother could have coached Blondie that played at Clemson's now with the Jaguars, okay? There's, there's certain parts to that, but recruits don't realize that. And most of them think they're better than what they are too. Hint. 
they're not always accurate with that. I believe that a lot of kids just look at the draft and think I should go there because they develop it. It's not equal. But if you have a great draft class, and like Florida State has a chance to get conservatively, they're going to get like eight guys drafted. You know what I mean? That's a lot. And that's something you can sell. How much of that do you think also just kind of helps the morale, NIL money? Like, I, I imagine when you can say, like, if you're Norvell, like, Michigan's got, like, 18 guys went to the comp. That's asinine. They got a new coach because Harbaugh's gone. But the new guys are like, hey, this this is what you do when you come to Michigan. I was part of this. That It's going to sell in so many ways. Can you go more than a year without having a good draft class if you're at Florida? You know, they only got a couple guys at the combine this year. But Or is it more just what have you done for me lately? And you can flip it back. I think if we're talking high school recruiting, you can – you can kind of negatively recruit Florida state there just because so many of the guys that they have getting drafted. Sure. We're, we're not high school recruits. Like, like and you can oh, just that's easily, happened. That's fact. Yeah. That you could, you could easily just go, Oh yeah. Like, Oh, you, you heard about Keon Coleman. You heard about Braden Fisk. You heard about Jared Burst. You heard about Jaheim Bell. You heard about all these guys. None of them started at Florida state. They got developed elsewhere, came here, and then just uh, in that spotlight, bullied people, got to the NFL draft. It was great for them. Cool. But they weren't developed at that program. And you can make that argument. And even with Florida, they had two guys at the combine. One of them was not a high school commit to Florida. One of them was at Arizona State for three years and then came to Florida and then went to the NFL. So you can make that argument for a lot of schools now. But also on the flip side, if you're recruiting in the transfer portal, you can go and any small school That's guy, true. they look at Florida State. Florida State can just go, Yeah, we're recruiting the transfer portal. Look at what we've done with our transfer portal guys. Jared Verse came from SUNY Albany and then, like, state of University, New York, Albany, and then went to Florida State and got drafted high. Braden Fisk went from the MAC with Western Michigan and got drafted high. Like, you can make the argument on both sides, I think, for high school recruiting it doesn't benefit Florida state to have this huge draft class because right. you, you can advertise it, but then every other school you're going against, you're competing against, you're just going to say, yeah, but they didn't do that work. Like, like, they, like they weren't the ones that developed these guys. Keon Coleman was a dog at Michigan state. It wasn't that Florida state made him good. He was a, he was a killer at, at Michigan state. Like he was awesome. Jared verse just needed to compete at a bigger spotlight. That's all you had to say to him. Braden Fisk just needed to compete at a bigger spotlight. That's all you had to say. So, I think that with high school recruiting, this huge class, it doesn't help Florida State that much. But I think that when you're looking at bringing in transfer portal kids that help you win right now, it helps Florida State a ton. And really, what you're trying to do is win these football games. So if you could bring in transfer sure. portal kids that win you football games, then you have the best selling point maybe of, of any university right now. There's a lot of ways to look at it. And that's why I posed the question to you, Brandon. It's, it's not an easy subject matter. Because there's so many angles and flat out, I know that like, I know this will shock you. Miami and Florida State don't like each other. In the recruiting trail, yeah, I know it's shocker, right? Miami and Florida State have taken shots at each other on how they've developed and who's winning. Transfer portal, not transfer portal. It's a back and forth. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that UF is in some way, shape or form in that as well. So on this ending point, just, just for fun, obviously Florida is faced year three with Billy. It's not looking good. You and I have not said many positive things about him on your, your show. Is there any reason to believe that Florida is going to have a surprising 24 and have more guys go to the combine? Not this year, but next year when they have more guys draft eligible. Why sell the point of why Florida is going to improve this year? I think the biggest selling point is having a starting quarterback for for year two like like grammar second year starting quarterbacks especially in the transfer portal they've taken these big jumps like i did this on the show uh on lock on gators a week ago or two weeks ago where you look at the transfer portal quarterbacks that were starters previously and then moved to a new spot and continued being starters they took significant jumps and then in year two at that program they took even bigger jumps like you look at bo nix was dog crap at Auburn, went to Oregon and then had a good year, year two, great year. Michael Penix Jr. was decent in Indiana, just hurt, went to Washington, had a good year, then had a great year. Spencer Rattler, 
went to South Carolina, had yeah. had two good years. And I think that when you see that that year two of an experienced starting quarterback, it tends to elevate the play around them. And, and for me, that's the biggest selling point. I'd also talk about the defensive coaching staff improvements there, um, specifically when you look at having Ron Roberts at linebacker coach and also the co-defensive coordinator and Gerald Chapman on defensive line was, was at LSU when they were really, really good uh, under coach O and then was with the Bengals during the Super Bowl run. So Gerald Chapman's defensive line work has been highly praised. I'm going to hope that he can continue to keep it highly praised in Gainesville. All right. Well, my last parting shot on this is Florida state will still be better than Florida this year. I don't think that's a really rough projection. And they will they will win. Uh, I mean, if you want to bet on that straight up, we can do that we, now. We can bet on it. I'll well, bet. I'll bet on. Do you want to bet on the game or the record? Just both. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet on them both. I'm fine with it. I think Florida State will have nine wins or more. Um, they could be seven and five if you know something went wrong with DJ. But they're a pretty good team, and they've got a they got their system in place, and they got a lot of veteran guys still. Florida, I think, is going to be five hundred ish, five and five and seven, six and six. And I think they'll get beat by 10 points or more by Florida State. What say you? I don't think that Florida State wins the game in general. I I I I do think that Florida You are State getting State. clipped on that. I'm put I'm putting I'm gonna right. push that. Okay. I'm gonna clip that. I, I think I think Florida State will have a better record. I think Florida will win the game. Okay. I uh I mean, there are psychologists in New York, too, that you can seek, but that's that's another point. All right, this is going to do it for Locked On Seminoles today. Please like and subscribe to this podcast. Share it wherever you may, and please comment and do anything you can to kind of promote this show, help us out on YouTube. Everybody have a great day. Thank you very much.